السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وآله وصحبه ومن والاه In the few minutes inshallah ta'ala we have um, I will uh, briefly expound on some of what I think are the essential components and principles of atheism and after that also some of the essential components of Islam regarding the question of the creator does God exist I believe that the components and the principles upon which most atheists base themselves to deny the existence of of God, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, are three or four. I'm going to mention a few of those. Number one, uh, some of them say that there is no evidence that God exists. You do not have enough evidence that God exists. That is their claim. <clears throat> Whereas we believe and most believe and know that there is plenty of evidence for that. But the answer to that, number one, is that from a logical perspective, the absence of evidence is not proof for non-existence. It's that simple. When I do not have evidence, for example, and I cannot convince you that somebody is behind the door which you cannot see, that does not prove to you that somebody is not behind the door. If I do not see something, it does not mean it does not exist. Even if I do not conceive of it that is seen intellectually or emotionally, does not mean it does not exist. When I ask a mother, do you love your baby? Or a wife who claims to truly love her husband? Or a husband who claims to truly love his wife? They say, we do, we do, we do. If I say, I don't believe you, you're a liar, they will be angry at me. But if the argument is, you do not love your son, you do not love your husband, you do not love your mother or your wife, because I don't see love, I cannot see it, I cannot touch it, therefore it does not exist. Ah. Of course, you cannot touch love. You cannot see love. You can see the effects of love, the consequences of love, the fruits of love, the consequences of the absence of love. And therefore, not seeing, not having enough evidence to you that something does not exist is not disproof of the existence of that thing. Number two. Well, for example, and, and I think many of you here have been students of science, of chemistry, for example. When we look at a chemical reaction and assume in this plausible argument that we are something in the dimension of the chemical experiment, inside the chemical experiment, if you imagine this presence inside the chemical experiment, inside of it, what the observer in that dimension would only see, would see only the different elements combining with each other in accordance to certain chemical laws inside the chemical experiment. Inside the chemical experiment, there is no presence of the external chemist who designed and prepared the experiment. And therefore, looking at the event from within the event does not allow us to see physically the experimenter, the chemist, 
And therefore, that is not evidence nor proof that the chemist does not exist. Three, uh, I think, is, is, is the role of chance, the role of randomness and the role of chance. In other words, the argument is life began by simply allowing inorganic, inanimate elements, components, for a long period of time to the effects of randomness and chance, and with time they transformed and they became living organisms. Well, the answer to that simply, as most of uh, as a scientist and other scientists certainly would respond and have responded, that order, order and organization cannot come by chance, no matter how long you allow it. Example, as Professor Fred Hoyle, a very famous mathematician and physicist, said, well, if you left uh, all the metals that you find in a, in a metal junkyard and you subject it to a tornado, however long you subject that junk of metals to a tornado, which is disorderly in other words, however long you subject it to that tornado, it will not become a 747 jumbo jet. And to say that inanimate matter becomes living on the basis of chance and randomness with the passage of time is much, much even worse than saying, scientifically speaking, in terms of probabilities, to say that you leave a junkyard of metals subjected to twisters and tornadoes, and with time it's going to become a 747 jumbo jet. That's simply impossible. In other words, inanimate matter left by itself does not become, by hazard, an intelligent living organism performing especially systematic, complex functions such as messaging, selecting, correcting, manufacturing, quality controlling, duplicating, storing, and much more complex functions that are performed by a living organism inside a cell, for example. Having said that, many, many scholars, scientists, the number of which uh, I cannot enlist, many of whom make these statements while they themselves happen to be not believing necessarily in an intelligent being in God, but the statements they made are supportive of what we are talking about here. For example, a very uh, so-called prominent evolutionist, Harold Bloom, says, I quote, the spontaneous formation. How many studied basic chemistry? Lay, raise your hands. Good, so I can still talk simply in, in those terms. The spontaneous function of a polypeptide of the size of the smallest known proteins seems beyond all probability. In other words, that that be produced randomly by chance even in the presence of those necessary amino acids to form that very simple protein. It's beyond all probability for it, for one such simple protein to form by chance, by random process. William Stokes write, for, for amino acids to form proteins by chance, the probability is so small, quote that he says, that it would not occur during billions of years on billions of planets, each covered by a blanket of concentrated watery solution of the necessary amino acids, end of quote. I come back to another quote from a very prominent, as I mentioned earlier, mathematician who passed away a few years ago, actually, and his colleague, very also prominent mathematician and physicist, I said Fred Hoyt, Professor Fred Hoyt, and his colleague Vic Ramasinghe. If, assuming 
the probability by chance of a very simple small protein that is contained in a bacterium, one of the simplest living organisms, if the probability of that very small, simple protein and, or enzyme to form by chance, uh, they compute it to be around, the, around 10 to the power minus 20. Do you know what that means? One divided by 10 by one next to it, 20 zeros. The probability of that occurring, if we talk only in terms of probabilities, but the probability of that occurring is 10 to the power minus 20. And in that bacterium, there are 2,000 like that. Now they, now they computed the probability that all of that would form by chance, and I quote what he said, the chance of obtaining them all, that is these 2,000 enzymes, proteins in the, in the bacterium, in a random trial is only one part in 10 to the power 40,000. In other words, the probability of that occurring by random chance is 10 to the power minus 40,000. An outrageously small probability that could not be faced even, he says, if the whole universe consisted of organic soup. In other words, already organic material are ready, and all the universe were made all of that with all of that. The chance for that occurring systematically uh, by itself is, uh, in other words, impossible. In mathematical terms, a number like 10 to the minus 15 is already in the impossible. This is 10 to the, minus, the power minus 40,000. So, Professor Fred Hoyle says in his work, Evolution from Space, that he co-authored with Vikrama Singh. Instead, I'm sorry, he said, indeed such uh, a theory that is, uh, and he's speaking in scientific language, that life was assembled by an intelligent uh, agency, uh, i.e. We, we mean God, he says, this should be so obvious that one wonders why it is not widely accepted as being self-evident. The reason are, he says, psychological rather than scientific, end of quote. Nafsani, not aqlani. It has nothing to do, in other words, with signs and facts. It is something nafsani, something in the nafs. And this is the statement of someone who has nothing to do with Islam. Well, because few minutes only are left, the third thing or the fourth thing that is, I think, seriously, the scholars, the scientists even said, seriously violated uh, in an atheistic uh, theory of the origin of life is that that violates the second law of thermodynamics. How many know the second law of thermodynamics? Raise your hands. Some do, alhamdulillah. How many know the law of entropy? Good, so that's the second law of thermodynamics. The second law of thermodynamics, which is a universal law, the most powerful law, as Einstein says, in the laws of physics, it says that you cannot produce order from disorder in a closed system. In other words, if the system is closed, no matter how much you left it, for how many long of trillions of years, it will only increase in randomness and disorder. It will not become orderly. And if you live in animate, in animate matter, for however long you want, for it to become living, is a violation of the second law of physics called the law of entropy of the second law or the second law of thermodynamics. Enough of that for now. From the Islamic perspective, there is tanzil, there is revelation, divine revelation. We know intellectually, we know rationally, we know historically, and some know spiritually more even than you would know intellectually that God sent messengers, and those messengers, God spoke to them through revelation, 
and through hijab. And God spoke to Moses kifahan, spoke to Moses sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and that was communicated to us. They are the experts, if you will, in the realm of spiritual knowledge, and their testimony is authoritative, like you and most of you and most of us, when, for example, you know, Fred Hoyle or, uh, uh, or Einstein or so said something about the laws of physics, though you have no knowledge of it, you can't even understand it, you say the expert authority said, so we know it is. In the realm of spiritual realities, the expert said, and they presented to us evidence at our level, and so we know. God says in the Quran, when about the human beings, every human being has embedded within himself or herself the knowledge that God exists. وَأَشْهَدَهُمْ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ أَلَسْتُ بِرَبِّكُمْ قَالُوا بَلَىٰ شَهِدْنَا When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us that in the early makeup of the human species, before they count, they came to this reality and this dimension that he subhanahu wa ta'ala imagined this, the genome of all human beings to be of the future is in the hands of Allah Azza wa Jalla and beyond any concept of anthropomorphic insinuation. He subhanahu wa ta'ala addressed all the beings, I am your Lord and you know that. And they all said yes, so that in the future and on the day of resurrection, you do not claim we did not know. In other words, we know, Allah says, that in the essence of every human being lies the reality that God is. And God is only Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. And thus, yes, you may choose what you may want to choose, but there is responsibility to bear in this world and on the day of resurrection, for you will be, we will be held to account on account of what we claimed to know or we claimed not to know. Moreover, second, in reflection, when we are meant to ponder and reflect in the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the vast horizons around us, in matter, in the universe, and within ourselves, as we observe that, there is enough indication, there is enough evidence for us to lead us as you heard earlier, even scholars who have nothing to do with our religion who say, this leads me to know for sure, definitively and exclusively that this life is made by an intelligent, quote unquote, that's simply a scientific term, being beyond these four dimensions as we understand them. Secondly, in the Quran, or thirdly, in the Quran, there is the ma'qul in the manqul. In the Quran, there are plenty, as many of you know, of ayat, signs, which you call verses, signs of the Quran that speak to us of realities in the natural world, which you call scientific facts that were mentioned 14 centuries ago, impossible for a human being to know 14 centuries ago, even 10 centuries ago, even four centuries ago, even a century ago, and some of which we're still discovering. Please allow me for just one, one or two more minutes. That's an, another way the Islamic approach also. Finally, and that's an approach that is also very special, personal and experiential, the karamat and the mu'jizat. The mu'jizat, which you call the miracles in English, of the prophets, of the anbiya, of the messengers. And the karamat and the miracles, some people call them in English, but they are karamat of the awliya. In this world, after the messengers, after Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that give definitive I say definitive, yaqini, conclusive certitude about God being and about Muhammad وسلم, being and truthful and about the hereafter and about paradise and about hell and about the arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and about the future experiences that God as a karama, as a gift gave some of the spirits 
to some of the spirits of his servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, God, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, has seen with the eye of his qalb, reflected with the eye of his heart, reflected or projected onto the four-dimensional sight, he has seen paradise. He has seen hell. He has seen the hereafter. He has seen the previous messengers. He has seen the angels. Nay, Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhumah said Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw with the eye of his heart God twice. In other words, certitude is achieved also in this way. There are awliya of this ummah in the past and even nowadays who to whom the knowledge of God is not intellectual anymore is not rational anymore it is for them like for you it is to see you physically for them it has become that way that is also because the karamat of the awliya are extensions of the mu'ajizat of the anbiya because the special gifts that the saints if you will have are an extension of the special miracles of the anbiya and the truthfulness of what they came with. Wallahu ta'ala alam wa sallallahu wa sallim wa barik ala sayyidina wa maulana Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.